And good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for being here. We have a very special guest here for this webinar. It's a very timely webinar. It is pruning for prevention and performance. Correct. And this is Lindsey Purcell. He is uh, a part of the, um, you're a board certified master, Arbor. master arborist and you are a, um, a urban forestry professional at Purdue University. So you're, this is kind of your element. It is. Teaching and kind of sharing uh, knowledge and information to everybody. That's what I do best. Well, we ran into each other at TCIA Expo last year and I said, Lindsay, he was giving some talks there. I said, Lindsay, we gotta have you on to do a webinar. So this is very timely as we were talking about pruning right now, especially with all the storms that have scattered throughout the country. You know, when crews are going out, they, they're gonna take this knowledge with them right. after tonight and really apply it to uh, their job practices, we hope, and, and, and hopefully everybody will be much happier because of it, including the customer. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, these storms that we've had are gonna challenge your pruning abilities with mitigating storm damage, so we'll address a little bit of that tonight. All right, Lindsay, well, thanks again for joining us, and uh, let's take it away here. All right. Thanks, All right. Jake. Hey, I can't think of a better way to spend an evening than with Tree Stuff and myself Aww. talking about pruning. <laughs> I appreciate the invitation to be here. Uh, tonight I'm going to talk a lot about pruning um, and also the uh, response of trees to pruning. We often don't think about that, but we, there's two goals in, involved here when it comes to pruning. Uh, pruning for performance means that the tree owner or the tree manager wants the tree to perform a specific function um, and wants to have that tree perform a specific ecosystem service in their, in their property, like shade or, 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 or cooling or framing or so forth. But the arborist is looking for something different. They're looking to create a more stable, sustainable tree element in the landscape. And that's what we're going to talk about, is how to prune to improve performance for the homeowner or the tree owner, and also prevention. Now, I know this sounds like a, kind of an odd question, but do you really know how to prune? I can remember many, many years ago when I first started this, I was asked that question and I said, well, sure, I know how to make cuts. And they said, yeah, just make collar cuts. Just make collar cuts. Well, that's fine, making collar cuts, but do you really know what to do once you get up in the tree? What do you know as far as the objectives? And that's what we're gonna talk about, how to accomplish some of those objectives, which will give that tree a more sustainable uh, form. Um, there's some resources available on pruning uh, and in the Purdue Education Store. They're free downloads. Um, they're, uh, they're easy to read. They're for pretty much any level. A lot of this stuff we're going to be talking about might be review, but some of it might be new and a good refresher. Um, there's also a video on tree pruning essentials, which a lot of companies have used for tailgate training and additional training for new crews. What I'm gonna be talking about will focus primarily on this latest publication, Corrective Pruning for Deciduous Trees. So uh, be sure to visit the Purdue Education Store, download those if you want a little more detail on that. So let's get started. And of course, I've gotta talk about safety regardless of tree work. Are you using safe practices? <laughs> Uh, working at Purdue and also the uh, chapter president for, or chapter uh, executive for the Indiana Arborist Association, everybody sends me uh, kind of cool pictures. And I, of course, this is one of the strangest ones I've seen. Uh, I'm like, look at that guy. He doesn't have any PPE on. Never mind, he's in a bucket with a rope. So, again, make sure you're using safe practices regardless of what you're doing as far as tree work goes. And of course, we'll be referring to the ANSI standards, um, which is ANSI A300 Part 1, um, which has just been recently revised. If you don't have a copy of that, be sure you get it. And of course, with the ANSI standards, ISA always puts out a new uh, BMP. This is one of the best BMPs I have ever seen regarding pruning. Um, it includes a lot of new information and new uh, approaches as far as pruning. And I think the most important thing is that it is objective-based pruning. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that as we go along. Um, when you get to the tree, what are your objectives? What are you supposed to accomplish in that pruning process? So just to make sure we're on the same page, I'd like to talk about some of the basic principles of pruning. 
First of all, at the very least, you are altering the morphology of the plant, meaning the shape of the plant. Anytime you prune, you're going to change the shape of that plant, especially if you're taking off some of the larger, more mature limbs on a large tree. And we're also changing the physiology of the plant as well. When we're taking live green tissue off the tree, some amazing things happen within that tree. The tree sends signals to its root zone, especially on larger plants, and can cause some issues with the roots as well. So anytime you make a pruning cut on live green tissue, you're changing the physiology of that plant as well as the shape or the morphology. Also, we talk about when we, when we prune what's been taken off the tree, what's on the ground. But I think what's more important is to take a look at this perspective as far as what's left on the tree. So, and this is especially important when we start talking about pruning doses. So we want to think about not just what we take off, but also what's left on the tree in order to sustain that tree and making sure that we don't exceed those recommended pruning doses. Another thing too, and we'll talk about pruning smaller trees as well in this presentation, but remember small cuts do less heal much easier and much faster than big boo-boos. So when we make smaller pruning cuts, um, the heel's more uh, capable of sealing more quickly and more effectively as a result of those smaller cuts. And also, of course, we'll talk a little bit about the healing process after pruning. So we're going to talk about proper technique, making sure we do make good pruning cuts regardless of the type of limb that we're cutting and also talk about the species profile re regarding uh, compartmental, uh, uh, compartmentalization of decay in trees. Remember, certain species uh, compartmentalize or close those wounds much more effectively and faster than, than some other species. And two things that I don't think we're looking at quite hard enough in the pruning decision-making process is looking at the developmental age of the tree and also assessing the health and vigor of the tree. That will make a difference in how we approach the tree as far as pruning and how that affects pruning dose. The older the tree, the less live green tissue we should be removing. Also, any tree that's stressed, we shouldn't be pruning live green tissue. Remember, that's the food source for that, pl for that plant. And if we're removing a lot of live green tissue, we could cr increase that stress within the tree as, as well. I'm going to start with looking at branch attachment. Before we start pruning, I think it's important for us to understand how a branch is actually attached to the tree, especially a branch to the parent stem. We know that there's a branch collar and a branch bark ridge formation. And the, if you see on the, on the image there, you can see that the, the branch actually goes into the tree trunk or the parent stem nearly halfway and sometimes more. This is a good branch attachment that's in, integral with the main stem. And as the branch collar is formed, you see this overlapping wood. So the tree is actually just creating new fiber around that branch so it holds it securely. A lot of times if you see a branch that's broken either from wind or some type of dynamic loading, it often won't break right next to the trunk. It's usually six or eight inches out past that. That's because that parent stem is holding onto that branch so well, it's very difficult to break there. Branches that come off very easy are often uh, epicormic sprouts or what we call suckers sometimes. And as you see in the image here on the bottom, oftentimes that's just attached to the xylem vessels. So as a result, it's very easy to break off. Um, this is an example of when I was up in a climbing in a linden doing some crown cleaning on Purdue campus. And you can see on the left, whoop, you can see on the left that that looks like a branch coming out of the tree. But all I had to do was just basically wrap it with my foot that tree trunk. So as a result, obviously those epicormic branches aren't well supported by the parent stem. So those are ones we definitely don't want to sustain or keep in the tree. Also in pruning, if we're aware of the two major parts of the branch, the branch bark ridge and the branch collar, we want to make sure that we don't get into that branch protection zone. And that's kind of a magical zone within the tree that has very special compounds that actually help the tree close or seal off that wound. And we'll talk more about that as we get into the pruning process. You can see on the right, 
Obviously not, obviously not a good... Uh, hey, everybody. Program. We're going to swap out Lindsay's microphone just to make sure that we are hearing you. We'll be back in about 10 seconds. Not working. Uh, The audio sounded fine. Okay. Check, check, check. One, two. Hey, we're back. So, like I was saying, back to the branch protection zone. Well, this is what we call a flush cut. So, as a result, we've taken away that branch protection zone and that tree's ability to actually close that wound as fast as possible. So, we want to make sure we stay outside of that branch collar and branch bark ridge. So improper pruning cuts, we've all seen these. You know, obviously there's some uh, less informed arborists out there, tree, tree trimmers um, that do not know how to make the proper cuts. And as a result, we see the ripping, um, stub cuts, which seem to be left behind way too often, um, which is basically a conduit for decay into the plant. And of course, you just saw the flush cut. You can see it's cut into that branch collar, which again is so important for that tree to recover from the pruning. And trees don't react well to poor pruning. So we want to make sure that we're cautious about how we treat our trees. So critical points to pruning cuts, like I said earlier, we want to make sure that we identify two important things. One, of course, is the branch collar. Now, it might be easy to identify, especially on young trees and in the lower canopy, um, but it may not always be present. And one thing that is always present and we typically see on any type of branch creation or formation is a branch bark ridge. This is the one identifying point that's really important to make sure we, we relocate before we make that pruning cut. And then of course, if we make our proper pruning cut outside of the branch collar and the branch bark ridge, we'd make our cut right in here. So this obviously would be a good pruning cut. I've kind of renamed the pruning process um, in, internally. Um, we, we use what we call the double cut method typically, but actually we know that there's three cuts involved in that pruning process. Um, just to review on how that works, of course, we make the undercut um, anywhere from four to six inches or more out on the branch. A lot of it depends upon the weight and where you're at on the, on the ground or in the tree. And then just outside of that undercut, we will make uh, the top cut until the branch actually falls. And the beautiful part about that undercut is the, is the branch snaps and doesn't create that ripping process. And now the third cut, which is the the third part of that ternary method is we actually cut off that stub. And as a result, um, we have a nice clean wound outside the branch bark ridge and branch collar. And this is what we hopefully will see in a short time. Depending upon the species and the size of the cut, it can occlude the wound within a year. Sometimes it may take five or six years or more sometimes. So it, again, it's very species specific on how quickly that wound is occluded. So just review, reviewing again, the double cut method really is a misnomer as far as how many cuts we make on the tree. It's important that we realize that we need to cut off that stub. So here we are kind of doing this on, in real time. Um, this is my friend Paul, he's making the undercut. Uh, usually it goes about a third to a half into the branch. We want to make sure, we, of course, we don't pinch the saw. And then you can see he just picked an arbitrary location, just a couple inches or so um, on the outside part of the branch. And as he cuts, uh, the magic happens there and we have a beautiful snap cut there. Again, a lot of times this is exactly where I see the, the branch pruning stop. Um, I know a lot of times in my neighborhood, I'm probably the only guy in my neighborhood that walks around with a pruning saw um, cutting off stubs. Um, sometimes the neighbors don't like it too well. But again, this is a part of the three, the three cut method or ternary method is make sure you cut that, that stub off back to the branch collar. So, and, and locating it sometimes a little bit of a challenge. You see here on this ash tree, uh, you can see the compression wood that's forming in the bottom part of this. And oftentimes this is mistaken 
uh, for a branch collar. Um, but obviously, if we would make our cut down into this location, we're gonna start getting into that branch protection zone. So it's very important that we locate the area to prune outside of that area. So we can see our branch bark ridge, um, which is up in this area, you, always uh, easily defined. In, in most situations. But again, determining where that branch collar is is sometimes challenging. Um, so if you're not able to identify that branch collar on the underside of the branch, the key thing to remember is make the smallest wound possible or the least amount of tissue exposed during that pruning process. Um, if ever in doubt, that's the, the perspective you should take there. Of course, Paul's putting, cutting off the stub here and we get that nice clean cut, uh, which is our goal. So let's talk a little bit about the types of cuts. Typically, um, arborists will make two primary cuts, or either uh, reduction cuts, which removes the larger of two or more stems at a branch union, or removal cuts, which eliminates the smaller of two branches at a union. So they perform very different functions. We're gonna explore those a little closer um, as far as the types of cuts and their applications. So with reduction cuts, typically we're trying to decrease size or reduce some type of infrastructure conflict, um, like with a light or a sign or, or gutters of a house or something like that. And also they're used to correct defects. And we can direct growth. Remember, as we're pruning off the top part of this tree, as you, or this branch as you see here, all the resources for that tree are gonna to go to this branch. So we're directing the growth out toward the side rather than upward. And so with that type of pruning cut, we can also reduce the size, but we can also direct growth. Um, this one's an easy one as far as a type of cut to make. Um, we sever the branch just above the branch bark ridge. And remember, try to make that pruning cut or exposed tissue as small as possible in order to facilitate healing. Reduction cuts, how do you make them or, or where do you put them? Again, oftentimes, especially in the upper canopy of the tree, if you're a climber, branch, or branch collars often don't form and they're very difficult to, to locate if they even exist. So where do you make that cut? Again, the branch bark ridge or the stem ridge is always going to be there. So that's our first location. So how do we angle our saw in order to accomplish that branch severance and have still the minimum amount of, of uh, tissue exposed. Well, oftentimes it's just a matter of altering your saw orientation about 30 to 45 degrees on the branch. Again, if we go too deep into the, the, the uh, branch, as you see here, this will cr create less tissue for the branch and could create a weakness and an opportunity for failure. So most arborists are gonna make the cut between cut one and cut two. Um, cut one would obviously make the, uh, uh, create the least amount of tissue exposed. Cut two, a little more exposed, but again, it depends on your angle and also the situation with the branch itself. Also remember, whenever you're doing reduction cuts, don't forget the one third rule, which means that this supporting branch needs to be at least one third the size of the parent stem in order for it to be a sustainable, sustainable cut. Uh, if we look at a live um, situation with a tree, you see we got co-dominant stems, and co-dominant is a, certainly a bad word um, when it comes to sustainable tree structure. And oftentimes we inherit those situations and try to correct them to prevent failure. So with this maple, this is one that I probably wouldn't have planted to begin with because it has a very poor structure. Basically, you're just planting a slingshot here. And with a co-dominant this pronounced, it's not a matter of if that tree is gonna fail. It, whoops. It's a matter of if it fails and when. So what we're gonna do is try to reduce that opportunity for failure by removing one of these co-dominants. So, we look at our branch bark ridge, which is where this arrow is located. And again, we wanna come about a 30 to 45 degree angle from that branch bark ridge in order to make our cut. So proper cut for this particular situation would be, as, as you see the dotted line there. So again, you can see the angle, it's about 30 to 45 degrees. 
um, and it bisects that perpendicular line. Up in the canopy, um, if we want to uh, create a, a removal cut here, a reduction cut here, again, we locate our branch bark ridge, which is where you see the arrow there. And again, about a 30 to 45 degree angle from that particular location of the branch bark ridge is the proper location for that cut. And typically I recommend that students cut um, from the inside out um, if you have the opportunity, if the branches aren't too close together so that you don't injure um, this branch that's left behind. So if you're cutting this way and as, the branch, as you, your saw proceeds through the, through the branch, um, or the stem here, you could injure with the branch that we want to retain. So it's best to cut from the outside in just to prevent any incidental damage which might occur. Now, this is the difficult part again. Um, the removal cuts, uh, or excuse me, the removal cuts with branch colors are, which are visible are, again are pretty easy. Um, we typically look for this branch bark ridge as we see here and then if it's a normal uh, branch attachment, we'll see the branch collar. We use these a lot of times for crown raising or lifting the canopy, or if we want to establish a dominant leader system in that tree, if we have a co-dominant system, or remove competing branches in the tree, um, or if we just want to look at what I call the three Ds of pruning, looking for the, uh, the diseased or dead or dying branches, which are, don't really provide any benefit to the tree, and those are the types of things that we want to prune. So in the canopy, you can see um, there's a branch bark ridge. It's very pronounced here. And then also the branch collar is located in this area. So this is a pretty easy determination on where to put our pruning saw. And you can see on the right side there, I was able to make a good cut there because I was able to identify both of those components of the branch attachment. And it looks like there's quite a bit of a stub here, but this is again part of that branch protection zone. If we would get inside of this branch collar and branch bark ridge, again, we're intruding into that branch protection zone, which can be an issue as far as sealing that wound or, or, or closing that wound so that we don't get any further decay into it. So remember, whenever you do prune, you're actually wounding the tree and the race is on really between the tree and the fungal organisms that want to cause decay. So we want that tree to close that wound as quick as possible to seal it off so that the fungal organism can establish itself and create decay within the tree. Back to what I was saying earlier, this is a difficult part. If there's no branch color visible, we have to make some good informed decisions on where to make our cut. We need two points in order to make a good cut. If we have the branch bark ridge, again, which was, is typically present in most of our, our, our trees, we will have that first location of cut. Now, where do we angle our saw in order to get the best cut? So well, the best uh, management practices indicate that we want to look at the orientation of the parent stem so, and draw a straight line with that. And to, in order to make our cut, we want to come about nearly perpendicular or a little bit less than that in order to make our, our cut. So we would cut from this direction out to get our good cut. Now if we cut a little bit low here, you can see that, remember if you're in doubt, you want to create the smallest wound possible. So this is probably going to be your best cut and most effective for sealing or compartmentalizing that pruning cut. There has been occasions, depending upon the species, especially if it doesn't compartmentalize very well, where if you do cut this higher area on the branch, you may have some cambium die back in this location. So it may be necessary to cut a little lower. Again, understanding species profiles and how they compartmentalize helps a lot in how to determine where to make that pruning cut. But nevertheless, the smallest wound possible is always the best practice if ever in doubt. So just locate where that uh, branch bark ridge is and then of course draw a perpendicular line, or excuse me, parallel line with the branch and then you'll go nearly perpendicular or uh, a little bit less than that in order to make your best cut. So here's another removal cut uh, example with no branch collar. Um, you can see on this maple stem, we can see the branch bark ridge is fairly obvious here, but really I don't see any type of branch collar below here. 
So as a result, where do you put the saw? Where do you, where do you make the cut in order to remove this limb, which is uh, causing issues with the parking space nearby? So again, I'll draw this imaginary line that is parallel with the parent stem. And then I'll make my cut about 45 degrees or more. Here's our 90 degree to nearly 45 degrees um, as far as the cut. So anywhere within this location would be an acceptable cut. Again, my determination is always, again, making the smallest uh, wound possible in order to, for that tree to facilitate healing. In the canopy, again, a little more challenging. So this is a hackberry I was pruning in, and you can see the branch bark ridge is right in here, but I don't see any sign of any type of branch collar in this location. So where do we put our saw? We know we're going to be, the top part's going to be out this area, but we don't know where to angle it as far as making our, compl our complete cut and severing the branch. So again, we would draw this imaginary line Here is our branch bark ridge. And if we were to draw our parallel line through here, we want to make sure that our cut will be somewhere parallel or excuse me, perpendicular to this. So as you can see, I've made that about 45 degrees or more to this. So we, we're outside the branch bark ridge and we're still not getting into that branch protection zone. You could even, to get, again, more perpendicular, you could come out as far as here. Again, that's a smaller wound potentially, but that looks to be like a little bit more of a stub. So I chose to err on the side of caution to create a uh, better cut to facilitate the healing. And you can see where I've got the cut right here. So this is actually where I made that final cut. So again, a lot of times it comes down to, especially in the canopy, we won't see a branch color. We'll see the branch bark ridge, um, which is our indication of where to start our cut, but we may not find that branch color. So again, uh, we wanna make sure that we're looking at the orientation of the branch so that we know exactly where to make that, that collar cut. Back to uh, co-dominant stems. This is one of the biggest issues I see as far as tree failure goes. Again, it's not a matter of if it fails, it's mostly a matter of when it's gonna fail. With the right dynamic loading, either from wind or ice or, or, or some other type of dynamic loading event will cause that tree to fail. So it's important that we try to get, minimize those and get rid of those as part of our objectives in creating that safe, sustainable tree. So as far as where to make those cuts has been a, a often asked question to me. Um, and again, basically we follow the research here. Um, we want to perform that cut as far down into this union as possible, uh, regardless of whether it's a removal cut or a reduction cut. So, and the reason being is really, this is just compressed bark in this, uh, in this area where the two stem ridges meet. So the size will depend if the entire stem can be removed, Again, that goes back to pruning dose, which we'll talk more about later. Uh, but again, we want to get down into as far as this included bark, or included bark area as possible and make our cut, again, without trying to damage uh, the stem that we want to retain. So it takes a lot of caution and care and precision cutting. Um, this is one of those where I uh, highly recommend in using a hand saw, at least to make the finished part of the cut um, in order to make sure that we don't damage that a stem or branch that we want to retain. So if we look at a co-dominant up in a typical canopy, again, this is one of those trees that's really poor structure. Um, and oftentimes this is one that we're, we're uh, confronted with as far as improving its, uh, its, uh, its sustainability and reducing that risk of failure. This is obviously to me, uh, one of those situations where that tree has a higher likelihood of failure because of the co-dominance. Um, but you can also see um, in here, we've got some included bark as well, um, which we'll talk more about as well uh, later. But as far as making the cut, 
Um, this would be as far down into that branch uh, inclusion zone as possible. Here we would be getting into the parent stem more. So if we're going to create a more dominant leader system in this tree, which is this one seems to be the straightest, uh, we would remove this codominant and maintain this one. Now as far as pruning dose, we may not be able to sever that entire limb in one, in one pruning session. It may take two or three. Um, in order to um, adhere to the pruning, recommended pruning doses. Um, again, that's very situational and specific, uh, depending upon health, age, and vigor of the tree. All right, so we've kind of talked about some pruning cuts um, and how we accomplish those types of cuts. So I want to talk a little bit about how the tree responds to that and the recovery process. So remember we talked about coded. We've heard about coded pretty much our entire uh, career. Um, the acronym created by Dr. Shigo back in the 70s, which is compartmentalization of decay in trees. This is a very strategic defense system against pathogens. And it's very important for the tree to be able to accomplish this and have the resources to accomplish this in order to seal those wounds, which we've created through the pruning process. Remember, trees are a little bit different than people. Um, we often use the, use the analogies as far as healing trees, but actually that's kind of a, a misconception. Remember, when we injure ourselves or we cut ourselves, we replace cells. Well, well trees aren't able to do that. They actually cr create that fourth wall, which actually creates a barrier and seals off that wound. So you can see this wound wood, which is on this maple, and starting to seal that off, and on this oak tree, it's completely occluded that pruning wound. So this is what we're after. We're after, again, sealing off that affected area to try to beat the fungal organism or whatever decay organism that's working on that tree and try to keep it from in, uh, inhabiting the tree and getting in there and creating more damage. So how does it help? Again, the race is on. Once that tree's wounded, um, it puts out phytochemicals that actually attract insects. It actually attracts uh, fungal organisms. In fact, that's one way that we scout for emerald ash borers. We'll actually wound the tree and it'll put out those chemicals that the insect can actually detect. So again, that speed of recovery is so important. Um, these are just an example of some maples that we were pruning in our nursery. And you can see with a good proper pruning cut within uh, six months, um, we had pretty much a good callus tissue and then in just less than a year this one was almost completely occluded. So those boundary walls, that fourth wall is what seals off this wound and the pathogen becomes left, less active, especially if it's a fungal organism working in there so it doesn't have the, the right environment in order to proliferate. So again, sealing that off is so important. All right, let's talk about recovery and wound closure a little more. So research has been uh, really active as far as the CODIT principle. Um, there is a, actually a new book uh, by Dr. Dewey Siefkin from the U University of Hamburg, which has done a lot of research on the CODIT principle and found some kind of new groundbreaking things as far as what are the essential parameters um, that are necessary to get that tree to recover from a pruning wound and get that closure. Well, first of all, it comes down to the diameter of the branch, but also the age and health of the tissue within that branch. Um, just like anything else, um, younger tissue tends to heal um, and recover much quicker and more effectively than older tissue. And also it comes down to just the tree species and its ability to recover and compartmentalize that, those wounds. So we have to look at the um, time of year as well. We want to make sure that the parenchyma cells are active, physiologically active during the pruning process. Parenchyma cells are so important within the tree, um, they're actually a part of the symplast, which uh, stores, acts as a storage organism for carbohydrates and, and starches, which are the resources that are necessary for the tree to seal and heal those wounds. Um, and also, went back to talking about the stress tree, um, and trees in decline or suffering from stress. Um, if it doesn't have those stored materials and it's not a healthy tree with a good bank of energy, then that tree is going to be less effective in closing those wounds as well. 
So the tree's going to recover from wounding and pruning um, if they have enough time and they can sort of outrun that race between the fungal organism and the tree. Does it have the energy reserves? Has it been healthy, plenty of water, um, not stressed from drought or, or pest issues or, or humans? Um, and also, does it have the genetic capacity uh, to compartmentalize that? And again, that comes down to the species profile. So all those things are very much a, a consideration when it comes to how much we can prune and what type of pruning that we're going to um, enact on the tree. So the research says that, again, some trees are more effective than others um, as far as compartmentalizing. Um, Dewey Siefkin from Germany and also um, my friend Ed Gilman, University of Florida, have done uh, a lot of research on this. A lot of it's anecdotal, but there has been uh, some research that shows that obviously some trees definitely compartmentalize more effectively than others. If you want to look up for th that information, it, the list can be found in uh, Dewey Siefkin's book, which is the new Codet Principle, and he has a pretty comprehensive list of trees that compartmentalize well and some that de 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 uh, excuse me, com de compartmentalize uh, poorly. So uh, say that three times really fast. I'm tr I was looking at the list and trying to find some generalizations there, and I think, well, um, softwoods that are considered like maples would tend to be uh, poor compartmentalizers. And of course, oaks uh, tend to compartmentalize very well. But as you can see from this list, there is no real generalization between those. They're all distinctly different in their ability to compartmentalize. So as a result, we have to kind of pay attention as to whether or not uh, we can be real aggressive with the pruning or whether or not that uh, we need to kind of back off and see how big of branches we're taking and how aggressive we can get with pruning does. <coughs> so the research says that also larger wounds and older tissue are slower to compartmentalize. Um, which allows that decay to go a little bit deeper. Um, this is a pruning cut that I made on a, um, a white oak um, five years ago, and it still hasn't sealed very well. But you can see that this is a pretty large cut. This was about a five and a half, six inch branch that had to come down because of some uh, conflicts with the utility line. So as a result, this had bit larger branch had to be removed. Not what you would recommend, um, of course, larger the branches, you're going to play a big role in the biomechanical response of that tree. Um, but again, because of the conflicts and the objectives for pruning, had to be removed. But you can see it is creating that wound wood around that uh, pruning cut, uh, but you can also see that the tree is going to suffer from some decay as a result of that larger cut. Recommendations based on research, again, this is uh, I'm the deliverer of the message. Um, a lot of this was based on the new CODIT principle, um, but when it comes down to it, two inch cuts should be about the maximum um, on trees that are poor compartmentalizers. That may or may not be possible depending upon the objectives that you have for pruning. Oftentimes there's no way we can escape the fact that we've got to take larger cuts. But if possible, you want to make smaller cuts on those trees which are poor compartmentalizers. Now, trees that are good compartmentalizers or are good at sealing those wounds, we can be a little more aggressive and take larger branches if you need to. But remember, if you're taking four inch or larger branches, you better have a good reason or a good objective because um, you're going to change the canopy geometry and how that tree responds to wind loading and so forth. So again, you better make sure you have a good reason why you're making those large cuts. Uh, and when we get to the larger cuts, instead of making a cut all at once, consider reducing it over a period of time rather than complete removal. Depends upon your client and your opportunity to come back as well. Uh, of course, always avoid that damage to the branch bark ridge and the tissue inside that line that's called the branch protection zone. And another thing that's important to remember also is try to do large branch pruning during the active growing season. Remember, the physiological activity of those parenchyma cells are really critical to sealing those wounds. So as a result, if we do a lot of pruning during the dormant season, especially on trees that are poor compartmentalizers, 
we may be exposing that tissue to a longer period of time that the fungal organisms are available to attack it. So a lot of it's timing, it depends on the species. Um, it may be a fact that uh, you wanna wait um, a little later on as far as uh, trees that don't seal well. Um, but also we gotta take into consideration depending upon where you're at um, in, the, in the viewing audience, um, if you're pruning oaks and oak wilt is an issue, uh, then certainly dormant pruning is, is, is advised. Now back to the pruning decision guide as far as size. You know, typically if you're under two inches, that's not a big issue because you're not going to play a big role in that tree's uh, shape or morphology and its response to, uh, to wind loading. Um, if you're looking at three to four inches, that's when I tell people you want to kind of think twice about what you're removing. Uh, because again, you're taking a lot of live green tissue as a result of that size pruning cut. And if you're into that uh, greater than four inches, you better have a good reason why you're removing that because that's going to have a pronounced effect, not only on the morphology of that tree, but the physiology of that tree as well. Because you are taking a lot of live green tissue as a result of that cut, which is going to change the way that tree allocates resources and survives that, that pruning wound. Back to the prevention versus performance, you know, oftentimes failures are predictable and preventable as a case when it comes to um, uh, codominant stems, which I see is probably the most common reason why we have tree failures. Um, our objective should be anytime we prune is to improve a weak branch structure. Um, make sure we got good branch spacing that allows good growth and, and formation of tree structure and allow for sustainable branch attachments. Um, research after research has indicated that that dominant leader or dominant structure is a key to a sturdy form. Now, this is an ash tree, so who cares anyway? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, this was an old neighborhood that I lived in, and they had been treating this tree uh, because it's the only tree in their front yard. But um, because of that co-dominant stem, um, there's an issue there. And of course, uh, with the right wind loading, dynamic loading on that branch, um, it failed as a result. So again, that dominant leader system is so important. Um, as far as creating a sustainable, safe tree structure. These are just some common uh, ones that I've seen here in the past uh, few years. Again, um, I'm kind of like the grim reaper of trees when it comes to people asking me about their trees. Uh, this was a, a neighbor, in, uh, in an old uh, neighborhood I lived in, um, the maple there on the bottom right. Beautiful red maple, the neighbor planted about uh, about eight years ago, and I was stopping looking at it, and I said, gosh, I said, what are you gonna do about that co-dominant stem? And of course, the neighbor said, what are you talking about? The tree's beautiful. I said, gosh, it's got an opportunity to split there if, uh, if uh, it gets the right wind loading. When two weeks later, this is what happened. Of course, I come by and take the picture, and uh, the neighbor wasn't very happy with me. But uh, again, it's preventable and predictable because of the branch structure. So. As arborists, it's up to us to try to improve or reduce that risk of failure in our pruning objectives. So yes, it is preventable and predictable. Again, co-dominance are the biggest issue. It almost seems without fail, unless it's a whole tree failure um, with the roots giving way. Um, oftentimes, it's just poor branch attachments, and usually these come in the form of co-dominance. Um, and just for review, um, remember, co-dominant stems are trees with two or more stems um, with similar diameter emerging from the same location on the main trunk. So those are the kinds of things we want to look for and try to improve. Um, they typically have narrow branch angles. Um, oftentimes we see included bark considered a very weak structural attachment. Um, and they typically involve decay in the union because of the included bark. Um, so they're very prone to splitting as a result of that. They, they include the bark as both stems uh, enlarge or grow. Um, they'll actually push against each other, and that's when you see that splitting, especially um, when you have that wind loading in addition to that. And they come in all sizes. So as a result, you know, you can have a very large trees, which are co-dominants, and stand for a very long time. Um, this was actually a lady uh, who called me to come look at her tree. Uh, she said she had a, a large oak tree in her yard that uh, was splitting. I said, well, 
you know, it's probably co-dominant and, you know, you can either prune it or perhaps ca cabling and bracing. Uh, she said, no, the, this is a little different situation. This is a really big tree and I'd like some um, advice on it. And she sent me a picture of it and this is what I saw. That's my clipboard there um, at the bottom of that split. And uh, she actually bought that lot next to her house to protect this tree and keep it from uh, uh, being removed as a result of development or something. Uh, but that's a 74 inch bur oak um, that would require about a seven foot brace rod. And I'm not sure that cabling and bracing would actually help in this situation. I think uh, to get the enough cables up in there, it looked like a hardware store. Uh, but again, they come in all sizes and how long they last or how long they're able to withstand that codomus, again, depends upon protection around it. Um, and also the loading on that tree. There's a lot of weight on this, uh, this poor structure. And as a result, with the right conditions, it eventually starts splitting. There has been some wound wood starting to develop around there. It is hollow inside. So I'm not sure if it's still there today, but uh, again, very large tree that certainly could have used some proactive pruning many, many years ago. Uh, this is another one. Um, this is actually over in Ur, uh, Champaign, Illinois, or, or Urbana, um, at the site of the old uh, original ISA headquarters. Um, this is another big uh, uh, bur oak um, in Neal Park. And you can see, just if it's a perfect co-dominant, um, why is it still standing? Good question. Um, as I walked around the site, it's very protected with other large trees around it, so it's not getting that wind loading on those branches, which can cause uh, that to split. And also, there's no decay in this union. It is co-dominant, a lot of load on defect here, but because it's protected and there is no decay in that uh, co-dominant area, then it's, it's, it's standing still to this day. I was almost afraid to look at it or talk about it because I'm afraid something will happen to it. But it is still standing today, so um, hopefully it will r remain that way. And again, this can be um, proactively managed with the right pruning techniques. With this size tree and this size codominant, there's, um, it's going to take a lot of mitigation as far as cabling, bracing, and pruning, but it can be done. So when I talked about bark inclusion, just to make sure everybody's on the same page here, um, oftentimes we have co-dominance as a result of the expansion of these two branches. We'll see uh, included bark, and this is what I call the hot spot. Um, this is where that tree's likely to split. They're not gonna split up in this area. They're gonna split where you have this uh, included bark, where you can see it start protruding, uh, typically at the bottom of the, of the branch ridge, and it creates a significantly more weaker attachment as a result of this. So the idea to the remedy this is try to suppress or subordinate these one of the branches in order to create that more dominant leader system, which is going to create a more sustainable tree. Lots of research supports this. Um, obviously, codominant stems were much far easier to split than branches that were small relative to size. Um, and also, Tom Smiley from Bartlett talked about um, the the significant weakness regarding uh, bark trapped in the union. So all those things contribute to a much weaker system which is more prone to failure. Determining which branches to remove often has a lot to do with size in relationship to each other. And you'll see this as a new component in the uh, best management practices, a concept known as branch aspect ratio. So we've determined that it isn't so much of the branch angle, but rather the relationship of the, of the subordinate branch to the parent stem. And what we want to look for is a ratio of about two to one or 50%. So in other words, this branch should be twice the size as the uh, secondary branch. And this is a much stronger, more stable attachment. Now at one time, um, I was taught, and we were often um, um, taught as far as which are good pruning at or branch attachments, was if they were less than 45 degrees, then it wasn't a good attachment. 
Well, this is obviously less than 45 degrees, but because of that branch aspect ratio, we have an example of a really good attachment here. So the lower that aspect ratio um, between them, then the greater likelihood we have of failure, then we're approaching uh, co-dominance. So you can see in this example, um, this is a, a maple branch that I cut, and you can see this uh, secondary branch is nearly a one-to-one -one ratio. Not a bad branch angle. Um, you don't see any included bark. Um, it looks like a good formation, but because of the relationship of the size uh, to the parent stem, this has much more prone to failure as a result of that. So again, we wanna make sure that we try to maintain at least a two to one branch aspect ratio when we're trying to decide which branches to remove, especially live green tissue. This example of a red bud uh, with again, one to one ratio, and you can see the included bark and decay inside of here. Um, and as a result, much more prone to splitting as a result of that. So it may stand for or, or, or last for a long time. Again, it depends upon the loading. Um, so as this, uh, as this gets larger, more decay in here, then of course it's gonna be much more prone to failure as well. Uh, this is Zelkova um, that I went to look at. Uh, they wanted to try to salvage it. Again, really what it comes down to is this tree shouldn't have been planted to begin with. Um, if you're involved in selecting trees and planting trees, you want to choose a tree with a good branch structure um, that's going to be much more sustainable, and you're not going to see this. It seems like once the tree gets to a good functional size, that's when it's more prone to splitting. Um, so again, this is one of those trees where it's about eight to nine inch in uh, DBH, and it's finally to the size where it's creating some uh, function for us as far as shading and providing oxygen and so forth, all those ecosystem services which we uh, so desperately uh, look for and need. But once it gets to that size, then it splits. And typically as a result, there's no rescue treatment here. Um, it could be cabled and braced, but again, it's not necessarily going to save the tree or, or, or keep it healthy for a long time as it would if you'd have chose a tree um, with a good dominant leader or created one at planting. So with some good proactive uh, pruning early in its life, right after establishment or planting, this could have been a much more stable tree and we wouldn't be talking about this today. So again, lots of research that supports this. Uh, Brian Kane from uh, UMass Amherst uh, talks where branch diameter is roughly 70% of a trunk diameter the attachment is half as strong. So you can see we've got a one-to-one -one ratio of co-dominance on this main stem. So um, its strength and its attachment is much, much less. So when I'm talking about co-dominant branches, um, what can we do to improve that and mitigate that situation? Uh, this was a uh, swamp white oak in one of the neighborhoods in West Lafayette. And beautiful shape uh, as far as that tree goes. Uh, nice six current uh, uh, form, but look at the co-dominant in, in that. Um, it's so obvious and it's like, all right, what do we do with that? Um, how can we remedy that situation? Again, does anything need to be done? Well, it looks like it's surviving pretty well right now and no issues, but remember, look around and you can see that that tree is much lower than the other houses. Uh, the, the houses around it, so it's kind of creating a microenvironment where it's not getting much wind loading. But as the tree parts get larger, the load on defects going to increase. Also, the amount of dynamic loading from the wind is going to increase as it exposes and gets above the tree to, or the house tops. So as a result, it's going to be more prone to failure. So. What we want to do is try to suppress these larger competing branches and, and select that dominant leader in order to create that more sustainable structure. So that's the whole idea behind trying to make that tree more sustainable because it's a great species, um, great location in front of the house. And, but once it splits, it's pretty much done. There's not much we can do with it. So again, a little proactive pruning will make a huge difference there. So this is the area of concern, or what we call our condition of concern and risk assessment. And again, that load on defect seems pretty minimal now, but as the tree size gets larger, it's gonna increase as well. This is what we're looking for. Now this is a red oak, 
and it has that dominant or central leader system, but not all trees are that perfect as far as creating that central leader system, especially those which have a more rounded or decurrent shape. Um, but by and large, we still want to create sort of a dominant leader system, not necessarily a central leader system. Big difference there where we don't have a lot of co-dominant branching tree structure within that canopy. So um, a lot of it takes with training experience on how to identify those and prune to improve structure. But the, again, this is what creates that sound stable structure that allows that tree to live and stand for a very long time. So uh, before I get into pruning dose, I think I'm going to take a break here uh, for a short minute and give you time to kind of digest where, I, where I've been. So is there any questions right now that uh, so far we've uh, talked about in the material? Yeah. We're going to go to break. Keep your mouth shut and your ears open. You've got to truly humble yourself every day and realize that one bad decision will be your last if it's the wrong one. Never stop learning. Learn and study a good arborist as much as possible. Watch them, watch how they work in a tree. You know, get their two cents, especially in business. That's been the biggest challenge for me is, is finding out that a relative degree of skill will not carry me through, that I needed to be diligent as well about the business side of things. If you haven't already gone to some sort of trade show, competition, whatever, uh, you know, get out and just shake hands with people. You'd, you'd be amazing. You'd be amazed how welcoming everybody is and how much they want to be there to help you. Uh, it's pretty inspirational. Don't just take one person's advice, you know. Seek out as, as much information as you possibly can. And also realize that it's not a single man sport. This is a team sport. It's a team occupation. And how we interact with each other, and how we make each other feel is just as important as how great you can climb and how wonderful you can rate. You gotta expose yourself to greatness. You know, you, you don't, don't, don't settle. If you feel like you're gridlocked and you're not learning, move on and go find somewhere where you can learn and grow, you know? So that's probably the best advice I can give. Soak it up like a sponge everywhere you can get it. I'm Carson with treestuff.com and I'd like to ask you to take a second to learn about the Fallen Families Fund. It's a charity created to provide small cash donations to families who have been affected by the death or injury of a working arborist. All of the administrative costs are covered by Cheryl Inc., so 100% of your contribution goes to help families in their time of healing and recovery. You can learn more and donate at www.fallenfamiliesfund.org. Hi, I'm Cale Royer, head party animal at treestuff.com. I'm here to make sure that everyone knows about our Tree Stuff party program. Each month, volunteer arborists from different regions host free recreational climbing events powered by treestuff.com, giving local arborists a chance to meet, hang out, climb, and try out some cool new gear in the trees. Every Tree Stuff party is 100% free, so there's no reason to not bring your family, friends, coworkers, and acquaintances. Check our Facebook events page to learn about upcoming Tree Stuff parties, and sign up to be notified when there's a new Tree Stuff party in your neck of the woods at treestuff.com parties. It's all about seeing friends, making new friends, and having fun in the trees. I hope you can make it to a party soon. <clears throat> hey Jake, I hear we have some questions. What do we got? We do. What, what are your thoughts on wound sealants? Oh, that's a very common question. We get asked about wound sealing all the time. Uh, of course, the BMP state that you should not use anything which will injure or damage the cells on the tree. Um, I still see it. I go in uh, Menards and all the big box uh, hardware stores and I see that tree coat wound dressing. That's a big no-no. We know that as professionals, but still a lot of our clients and homeowners expect us to use that. Again, that's a petroleum-based product which will actually kill the cells that we're actually relying on to seal that wound. Um, so that type of sealant is not good for your trees. Now, 
There has been some, a little bit of research, but not a lot done on a product called Lac Balsam, um, which will actually kind of seal that wound a little bit, almost like a, a liquid bandage, if you will. And it has shown some notable success as far as accelerating that uh, healing process. So uh, that's fine to use. Again, as long as it doesn't damage the, the tree cells, that's, that's the main thing. Okay, Nels Backstrom is asking, at what point is it too late to remove a codom? We have a lot of maples on the parkways that have not been pruned in 20 to 30 years or have only been pruned for street clearance, never for structure. What are your thoughts, Lindsay? Well, it gets to a point, again, we're looking at pruning dose, which we're gonna talk about here. Uh, but the one thing you can do, and I'll, I'll get to that in the presentation, is give you some scenarios here. But you can still subordinate some of the uh, codominance. You don't have to remove the entire limb, which would remove perhaps a whole side of a tree. But if you suppress or subordinate some of those codominance, again, what we're doing here is reducing that load on defect. So as a result, it's a little less prone to failure. So I really don't think that there's uh, any time it's too late for mitigation of serious codominance. If they're really large, it may be a combination of pruning along with cabling and bracing to help that situation. But again, it's very situational and, and, and uh, case specific. Okay. Now you mentioned walking through your neighborhood cutting off stubs. <laughs> yeah. So when is it too late to cut off stubs and still be helpful to the tree? Never. If you see a stub, remove it, but only cut it back to the branch collar. Um, again, Remember, if you ever seen uh, in the woods, uh, some trees are will uh, naturally drop branches, um, or they may break off at three or four inches from the trunk, and you'll see these large burls growing on the side of the tree. So what will happen is that branch collar, branch bark, uh, uh, branch protection zone will actually grow and keep growing and keep growing and try to seal over that stub, but it takes forever to get out there. Really want it, what it wants to do is just seal that wound. So if you can cut back those stubs to where the living tissue is, and you can often see where the living tissue is trying to come out on that branch, you've done the tree a favor so it can seal, seal much faster. Uh, also, in regarding uh, codominant stems, uh, Amy's wanting to know, uh, are you recommending putting in, you know, cobra or any other type of dynamic cabling? Um, really, that depends upon uh, the situation. Uh, we're referring to dynamic cabling system, which isn't invasive using hardware. Sometimes that's a little better um, in situations if you have decay or you can't put hardware into the tree using a static system. Uh, some people prefer that over any method. Uh, but again, it's very situational. One's not necessarily better than the other. It has to do a lot with the tree situation. Um, it's health, vigor, and how much decay, size of limbs, uh, things like that in the tree. Okay. Uh, Chuck is asking, um, what were you saying? It's, is, is it a fair idea to prune a tree during the growing season because it's more active and able to seal up the wounds quicker? Yes. Uh, so again, oak wilt aside, I realize that we've got disease issue. No pruning should spread diseases, so we've got to always keep that in mind. But um, the research indicates that if you prune while the tree is actively growing during the growing season, that it will seal much more quickly as opposed to if you wait till towards the end of the season, say like November, December, and prune then, again, it, that tree's gonna wait until the growing season in order to, for that, um, those cells to become active and start sealing the wound. Okay, last question for now. Justin wants to know, what would you use to help protect a flush cut? A flush cut, one that's already been cut. There's not really, if it's already flush cut, there's really not much you can do there as far as just hope that it seals very quickly. To protect against creating a flush cut, again, make sure you identify that branch bark ridge and also a branch collar if it's present and try to stay out of that branch protection zone. If you stay outside of there, that's the best way for that tree to recover from that cut. So we'll get back to some questions later. Um, I'll continue on here with uh, what, 
we uh, were talking about earlier with a pruning dose. Uh, this has become a lot more pronounced in the new BMPs, which I think is a great, uh, a great thing to include now. Um, one of the first things I want to talk about is in, in the BMPs is pruning operations should remove no more living material than is needed to achieve objectives. Now again, we're going back to the objectives. What do we want to accomplish when we get to that tree? Mrs. Smith, who's called you to prune her tree, she says, I want you to prune my tree. Okay, you say, all right, well, I'm gonna go prune your tree. But we should be asking, what do we wanna accomplish? What is it in the tree that needs remedied or needs mitigated in order to accomplish the objective? We don't just randomly go up there and prune. Uh, there's obviously something we wanna achieve in that process. Um, so we wanna make sure we're, we're aware of those. And actually in the BMPs, there's a sample form uh, for an estimate that actually has you list out the objectives, which I think is good mindful uh, decision making as far as an arborist and doing good pruning cuts and not doing too much. So we want to focus on mitigating those non-beneficial plant parts as I call them. And those really don't count towards uh, your pruning dose. So what I'm talking about is like I said earlier, what I call the three Ds, a dead, uh, dying or damaged. Uh, crossing branches, um, epicormic sprouting up in the tree, um, anything that's already dead certainly doesn't count towards that pruning dose. Um, but again, we want to get rid of all those suckers and, 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 and vertical sprouts which aren't really contributing anything and actually taking away from the tree somewhat as far as uh, resources available to it. So we want to look at pruning cycles which affect pruning dose. Again, we, our objectives may indicate that we need to take a large amount of tree of live green tissues, but as a result of that, it may put the tree in decline or stress, so we may need to do it over a period of a couple years or more if we have the opportunity. Again, it depends on your client. We may have only just one shot to achieve those objectives, um, but hopefully we can educate our client or the tree owner, say, look, if I do the, all this pruning all at once, we could put the tree in peril as far as stress and actually do more harm than good. So it's all relative to tree health and vigor. The healthier the tree, the more aggressive we can get. The younger the tree, the more aggressive we can get. Um, because again, it's all about uh, time, energy, and allocation of resources and, and resources available to that tree. Um, if it's stressed or in decline as a result of perhaps drought, then of course we have to be mindful of that and uh, not uh, remove as much green tissue. So how much do we take off? That's uh, kind of a nebulous question, um, but typically the older the tree gets, the less we should be taking. So, and I'll go through these three different scenarios and how much we've, uh, we take off and where we're taking off and some pruning decisions in those process. So obviously you can get really aggressive with the young newly established trees. I pruned as much as 80% off on a, on a two, tree that's been in the ground two years because it had such poor structure. But again, it's young, vigorously growing, uh, well managed and maintained by the tree owner as far as water, fertilization and so forth so we can become more aggressive. But as that tree ages, it really doesn't need any pruning uh, with the exception of a couple of things which we'll get into a little more uh, later. So let's put this all into practice um, and look at how we're going to prune uh, the three different types of what I call developmental ages. Um, as far as the pruning process, the thoughts are or what are our objectives. Of course, we want to think about health first, um, get rid of broken branches, crossing branches, um, irregular growth and vertical branches, uh, epicormic sprouts, those things. Co-dominant stems are certainly a major objective in order to reduce the uh, likelihood of failure of those branches. And think functional. We don't really need to think aesthetically as far as the shape. Uh, what we want to think of is what's the functional aspect of pruning in order to accomplish our objectives. Then step back, review it, see if there's anything we missed, did we complete our objectives, and does it look like we've done what we needed to do? Um, there might be, you know, if you're pruning up in the tree, your ground guy might need to take a look around before you come down and see if you missed anything, or there might be, you know, a wild branch growing out that you might not have seen from the inside the canopy. So those are the types of things we want to look at. 
Now, we'll start with a young tree, and this is easy to do, and this is where I think folks in the, especially the landscape horticultural industry could do the greatest impact as far as first selecting a tree with a good tree structure. But if you get a tree or inherit a tree with poor branching structure, while it's still young, make those pruning cuts. So again, this is one of those I picked out at one of the big box stores. Um, and obviously this is uh, a, a, a tree that somebody's gonna pick out as far as a homeowner goes. But you can see the co-dominance there is very, very obvious as far as uh, here and also up in this location. So just a couple of cuts while it's still young will create a much more stable dominant uh, leader and you may never have to prune it again. So through the magic of some virtual reality, we removed a branch there, which was a major co-dominant, and then the other branch, and we've got that central leader system. So as a result, now we remove those branches. Now the resources are gonna start going to these other uh, tertiary branches, smaller branches, and we'll start cultivating those as permanent branches later on. So this is easy to do. Just a few cuts while the tree is young is so important. This is what I call the holistic approach to arbor culture. Again, this is a, there, here's an example of some trees on campus, uh, which we're about to start pruning as a class this year, but they were, they were planted as they were out of the nursery, and you can see there's a lot of issues uh, with the tree, but structural pruning when that tree is young is less costly, it's much easier to do, and reduces that need for pruning later. Also, remember we talked about the smaller wound size and the amount of exposed tissue, that's the whole goal. The tree will recover from that very quickly, you won't even know it happened and develop that central leader. So we may have to look at the tree. Obviously we can't establish that eight foot clearance over the sidewalks all at once or we're gonna have uh, Dr. Seuss's truffle tree here. So we wanna identify some temporary branches that we're gonna prune a, a little bit later and identify our lowest permanent branches so we make sure that we don't take off too much and destroy the form of the tree later on. So again, it's sort of a, lo a logical process. Oftentimes it's better to prune these young trees at planting time and then sometime within the next five to seven years um, we can start identifying those uh, temporary branches and lowest permanent branches. So again, this is the best time to do that pruning, but oftentimes we don't get the opportunity to do that. And so as a result, we inherit these problems. So moving up into the larger tree, we have an established tree. This has been in the ground about 10 to 15 years. Um, and we can see this has an obvious codominance. Like, oh, this is the only tree in the guy's front yard, and he loves this tree. And again, this was in an old neighborhood, and I said, oh, gosh, you got a beautiful red maple there. Uh, of course, you got a codominant. So again, I explained to him, here's the load on defect here, so we've got to take care of that and create a more sustainable form. So we, our objectives in this particular pruning process is reducing the potential for failure, which is obviously the load on defect here, um, establish that dominant or central leader system, and we need to also consider recovery potential. Red maples uh, may or may not be such great compartmentalizers, so our pruning dose is gonna make a difference in what, how much we can take off, because we're gonna be taking off a lot of live green tissue in accomplishing this reduction as far as um, um, the codominant goes. So through the magic of uh, virtual reality here, change this tree into um, our cartoon image here, if you will. So again, we're gonna look at this uh, from a standpoint of different types of cutting and pruning sessions. So if we were to take this over a period of, if this could be in one session or this could be over a period of several, but again, we'll take this top part out. Here we got a code dominant in this location as well. And so what we wanna do is really reduce the load on defect in this area. Um, as we're removing this branch, we're removing its ability to uh, catch wind, uh, but we're also removing the weight or load on that defect as well. So this is what we would end up with um, after the first cut. You can see the cut removed here. Now our second cut, if we, again, depending upon um, how healthy and vigorously growing that tree is, hopefully as arborists, we've looked at that in advance, um, the tree was dormant. So how do we know if the tree is healthy and vigorously growing? 
We obviously look at the, inter, the internodal growth between the buds to see if it's expanding well or if they're very short. That probably means it's in decline or stressing in some form or fashion. So we may need to be less aggressive in accomplishing our objective here. So we may want to just go ahead and, and remove this if it's healthy growing, or it could be one of those situations where we need to wait till next year to take the rest of this off. So this is what we would end up with. Again, we've removed a great deal of tissue here, so it may be a good idea to wait until the next season to prune this off, because we still have another codominant over here we need to manage. Um, this is not gonna remedy itself. It's still just as bad as the, as the main stem down here. So our next cut would be taking off the other codominant, and then of course some of these other little ancillary things uh, which are smaller codominants. That could be an issue later on. So um, this is what we uh, end up. This is all of the branches that we took, and this is the, what is left behind. So you can see we've created a pretty stable central leader structure. So we've got a kind of, we've, we've basically remedied that situation as far as I'm concerned in my mind. We saved that tree's life and that tree owner's ability to keep that tree for a very long time. Again, with this codominant, it's not a matter of if it's gonna fail, it's a matter of when um, it gets the right loading or the right conditions as that tree, those tree parts get larger. Now moving up to the medium age trees, um, this is what I call sort of that 25 plus year range. Uh, we're looking at uh, DBHs above about 15 inches or so. Um, we're looking at codominance that we saw earlier. You can see the included bark and this sweet gum. You know, this is one of those, again, that should have been pruned a long time ago, but wasn't. Um, and as a result, it's much more prone to failure. Um, this is our case scenario tree. This was in a subdivision in West Lafayette. Um, red oak tree, only tree in their front yard, very concerned about it. The reason they called to have it pruned was basically to do a crown raising here because her husband kept hitting his head with the lawnmower and so forth. And that's when I brought this uh, uh, weak branch structure to her attention and said, look, um, this has a potential for failing as a result of this co-dominant. We got, again, that one-to-one -one branch aspect ratio in here. And so we may, might need to add something to our objective list here. So I recommended the removing that dominant leader, or excuse me, creating that dominant leader system and then balance the crown for stability uh, by removing a great portion of that side of the tree. Again, we're changing the morphology of that tree, which will create um, a potential for um, torsion or crown twisting as a result of that unequal crown geometry. Um, we want to also subordinate or reduce the weight on these other codominants. And this is my list of objectives. So as we move forward, again, we're going to change our tree and magically into this uh, uh, form where we can manipulate it. And again, depending upon the, uh, our opportunity to prune, can we come back or is this a one-shot deal? We'll make a difference on how many pruning cuts and how much live tissue we can take off of here. With a medium age tree that's healthy, we can be pretty aggressive here. So uh, it's not that big a deal, but should it be um, an issue, um, then that's gonna be, uh, reduce our opportunity to get really uh, take a lot of light green tissue off. This is kind of what we would see if we did nothing at all. So if we didn't prune anything, this is where I would predict the likelihood of failure on this major branch here. And then this co-dominant up here, it's gonna catch wind and break out the top. So if we did any, nothing at all, this is what I would expect out of that situation. Of course, this is as arborists, we wanna be proactive. This is what we wanna to try to prevent. If we were doing a single session removal cut, these would be my areas or conditions of concern, codominant in the lower canopy, codominant in the upper canopy, and this is what it would end up being. So one cut, we're removing roughly, oh, 40, maybe 50% of the canopy. Medium age tree, good health, not that big a deal probably. Again, it depends on what you as an arborist determine its health and vigor is. Um, as far as how, much, how aggressive you can be. Uh, there is a limb removed in those two locations. So this accomplished our objectives pretty much with the exception of a little crown raising down here at the bottom as the client uh, wanted. Now, if we were gonna do this in a period of three sessions, this is how I would uh, recommend doing it. Again, we wanna reduce the load on defect. 
by trying to remove some of these upper branches. Uh, again, trying to reduce the amount of sail and load on this uh, co-dominant area. This is what we would see afterwards. Also, because we haven't taken off a lot of live green tissue to, at that one printing session, we can get rid of the little bit of load on this defect as well by removing uh, some of this upper canopy. And so here's that area removed here. Also, looking at our pruning dose, again, when I prune, I'll often have, especially if I'm concerned about pruning dose, a lot of times, instead of the ground guy running brush to the chipper as soon as it hits the ground, I'll often have them pile the live green tissue in one area where I can see it to kind of get an idea of how much you're really taking off. Because I know for myself, once I get moving up in the tree and start, or, or on the ground and start taking off, uh, you see the problems, so you start pruning, and all of a sudden you look down and you go, ooh, Man, there's a lot of leaves on the ground here, a lot of branches. I might need to halt here and slow down and maybe talk to Mrs. Smith and say, hey, can we come back? We obviously don't want to prune any more than we have to in order to uh, not put that tree in any more decline or, dist or, or distress. Now, this is what we uh, ended up with after that first pruning session. Uh, trying to re Again, all we're trying to do here is reduce the load, load on those defective areas. Now session two, we're gonna look at trying to again, remove some of the load on defect here, major branch um, that's supported by this codominant, and also some of the lower branches as they were wanting earlier uh, to try to elevate the crown. This is what it would look like at that particular point after our third session. And also again, a little more crown raising to try to accomplish our original objectives. And this is what it looks like at the completion. A Little more pruning on this area. Uh, took over a few other little branches that were co-dominant and tried to balance the crown. Remember, we took a lot of light green tissue on this, on this side. So in order to you know, kind of uh, balance the appearance and shape and morphology of the tree, take out some of those other branches as well, which really doesn't contribute to the overall printing dose, but can have an impact on it. So this is what the finished product looks like. Um, when we look at the tree, this is how much we actually took off. So if we were to do this all in one session, that might be excessive and put that tree into distress. Um, and this was what the final product looked like. So again, again, oftentimes you don't realize how much you're really taking off when you're trying to mitigate these structural faults and, and deficiencies. And so it's a good idea to keep track of that. And again, be mindful of the developmental age and health and vigor of the tree. So real important to look at that um, before you start getting into the, into the pruning. So prevention imp improves that performance. Again, our goal is to try to mitigate the issues that could lead to failure. And we see that these are just random pictures are taken, office parks, parking lots, and subdivisions. And again, you see the overwhelming issue here is a lack of a central or dominant leader and co-dominant stems. Again, they're just so prevalent and oftentimes uh, so easy to uh, mitigate and oftentimes they're not. Once again, they get to that functional size, um, that's when they fail and oftentimes leaves the homeowner or tree owner very frustrated. So um, the last thing I want to talk about is the big trees. We've talked about you know, the, the smaller established trees, medium aged trees. So what about the big guys here? These are the ones that are creating all those ecosystem services that we look for. What do we do? What is our objectives here? So remember that when you're pruning older trees, we actually could be doing more harm than good. Excessive pruning, especially live green tissue, um, can cause some serious consequences, uh, especially if we're re removing a lot of those large um, light leaves that are so important for uh, photosynthesis. Um, we have a reduction in carbohydrate levels as a result of removing excess um, tissue. Every woody part of that stem is a storage organ for that tree and carbohydrate resources, energy, energy resources for that tree. Excessive pruning also causes a reduction or a reduced growth in the root zone. And that's not good for the tree either. We want a great expanse of roots. 
which reaches out more nutrients, more water. And so as a result of excessive pruning, we'll see a recession of roots as a result. Also, excessive pruning causes epicormic sprouting. Epicormic sproutings have high water demands um, and actually can be detrimental to the tree um, if we get an excessive amount of them up in the canopy. So what, really the recommendation based on the research is really pruning dose should only be 10% or less of live green tissue. Uh, and again, we want to assess the vigor and health of that tree before we actually even get into mitigating the objectives for, for that particular pruning project. So mature tree process, again, justifiable objectives. What are we looking for? We should really be looking for only just a couple of things. One is load mitigation. If we're pruning a tree we've never pruned before, we're probably going to find a lot of structural defects. We can't, on a large older tree like we saw the one in Champaign and even this one, we're not going to be able to correct those codominance by pruning. So if we can't, or even overextended limbs that we see, if we see a weak point or uh, poor structure, we just want to mitigate the load or have a load reduction on that defect in order to try to reduce that likelihood of failure. And also focus on those non-beneficial plant parts, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the suckers, epicormic sprouting, crossing branches, just simple things like that. And again, be mindful of that pruning dose so that we don't remove any more leaf tissue or live green tissue uh, than is necessary. These are those epicormic sprouts I was talking about. This was a, a linden that I was up in a couple days ago. And you can see this looks like a branch that's emanating from, uh, from the trunk itself, but all I had to do was just pull it down with my hand and it severed it from the trunk. So obviously this was only attached to the xylem vessels um, just underneath the, the bark and not an integral part of that stem. So these are some examples of some of the things we want to remove. Um, again, more non-beneficial plant parts. These are all suckers and epicormic sprouts that were growing up and down or uh, down the length of this branch. So what we want to do is try to clean out some of those so that we can balance the crown, reduce the, the, the demands by those sprouts, and allow the resources to get to our branches that are more beneficial to the tree and more sustainable for that tree. So as far as mature tree pruning, I, a lot of times the best thing to do is nothing, unless you do have an issue or condition of concern that could increase the likelihood of failure. So we want to mitigate the load on those defects or again, those non-beneficial plant parts. Just improving structure is what we want to do. We may need to combine with some supports, again, going back to the dynamic or static cabling, embracing. Um, those are things that can also help mature trees um, if the situation dictates. Um, relieving mechanical stress on those larger branches, especially with defects. It's all about load mitigation when it comes to mature tree pruning. We want to reduce the load on defects so that branch doesn't fail. Uh, if we, have, we don't want to just sever the branch because we think it might fail, uh, but we, if we reduce the load on that branch, then we improve the life of that as well. And then, of course, periphery pruning for clearance. Oftentimes, trees get much larger than people think they're going to get after they plant them, or when they see them in their yard, they start growing into structures, start growing into buildings, start growing into lights and so forth. So we may have to do some clearance pruning as needed um, to improve that situation. But certainly no interior pruning. We all know what that's called, uh, lion's tailing. Uh, again, remember, that tree is a large sale when it's in leaf. And what we have done by, and this one was pruned primarily so that the tree owners are, uh, could see out the windows and people could see their home. But it was a huge disservice to this tree. As I mentioned, that tree's a big sale. So as a result, we have just raised that center of mass, which puts our bending moment much, much lower. And we have a larger load on defect as a result of that. So it, remember, leaves and, and green tissue actually serve as a damping mechanism to dissipate that wind energy. And by removing that, that puts a much greater stress on these attachments. By moving the center of mass up in here, that puts a lot of sway on that branch, which means a greater opportunity for failure where its attachment is. So again, no pruning should be done on the interior with the exception of just removing some epicormic sprouts. We want to do most of our pruning, a reduction pruning, 
um, on the periphery of the tree. Big no-no. To kind of finish off, I want to talk about loaded on defect, just an example here uh, to finish up. Um, this was a tree, a Norway maple, um, in a, a residential yard. Lost a branch already. They didn't want to remove the rest of the tree. Um, but we certainly had a bad branch attachment here. A lot of included bark, um, uh, not co-dominant necessarily, but it was already starting to look like it was splitting in this area. So really the only thing we could do again is reduce the load on defect. Now how that works is if we look at this tree and we see that this, let's say the branch is about 35 feet overall from the trunk to the, to the edge of the drip line. So this overextended branch is creating this sort of a splitting action here, which is exactly what happened over here. But if we were look at our physics, let's say uh, the majority of the, the branch weight is about out to 25 feet. Well, this means if this is, let's say this is a hundred pounds, or excuse me, a thousand pound branch. That means at 25 feet, there's 25,000 foot pounds of torque on this attachment. That's a lot of weight. And we can see why branches fail, as a res especially poor branch structure, as a result of that. That's a lot of force, downward force, on this attachment. So if it doesn't compensate with uh, additional reaction wood then, and to support that, and if it gets the right uh, wind loading, then that's when the tree fails. So when we look at this, again, we don't necessarily have to remove that branch, but perhaps just mitigate the amount of load that's affecting that branch. And that's the kind of pruning strategy we look for there. So really all we need to do is just start taking out some of the peripheral areas. Again, how much depends upon what you believe that work for that situation, um, but that's pretty much uh, as far as I would go. If we remove this large limb here, then we're gonna leave a pretty significant wound on a tree which doesn't compartmentalize very well and also really change the structure and, and, and morphology of that tree, which could have a negative impact on it as well. So that's kind of a, a strategic look um, from a physics point of view of how the load or on defect can affect that tree's ability to withstand it. And, uh, and it's opportunity for failure there. So again, overall residual re re risk is reduced as a result of that uh, removal. So uh, kind of finishing up here, and then we'll get to some questions. Um, really pruning activities, I don't know what's going on there, sorry. Uh, pruning activities should be responsive to developmental age. So the age of the tree will dictate how aggressive you can get, also looking at the health and vigor of the tree. And we need to create some balance between the mechanical objectives or our pruning objectives and considering the biological consequences. And again, that all comes back to age, vigor, genetic capacity, the amount of resources available to that tree, and can it overcome the actual wounding that we're, we're enacting on that tree as a result of pruning. And that's, I always follow the dude's advice, um, abide by the physiological needs of the tree. If we pay attention to what the tree is telling us, then we'll know exactly what to do as responsible arborists. So, um, like to th again, this is not my research or anything that I've done. I would like to recognize a lot of rock star researchers out there that are doing uh, some fantastic work to help us keep uh, uh, trees living longer and standing longer and make our jobs a lot easier as far as, uh, as keeping trees healthy and safe. So, and Then one shameless plug, uh, I'm the executive director of the Indiana Arborist Association. Welcome anybody to come to our annual conference. If you want to hear a lot more about how to maintain trees, we have speakers from all over the country. Uh, come to Indianapolis in January each year. Um, our 72nd year is uh, coming up in 2020. So. Uh, welcome anybody to, to come and join us. So uh, I think with that, that's pretty much it. Jake, we have any questions come in? Well, I, I couldn't see if you had that graphic up. How can folks get a hold of you if they have questions, uh, you know, more in depth than uh, what we covered tonight? Uh, if anybody has a question about the presentation or a tree question, um, they can just contact me at Purdue University. Uh, my email is lapurcell at purdue.edu. 
if you just Google my name, uh, my contact information will show up with Purdue. So it's pretty, I'm, I'm pretty easy to find. Or ISA, obviously. <laughs> yeah, in the Ann Arbor Association, you go to that uh, web link there, um, and you'll have a list of our board, board of directors and also my contact info. All right, very good. Uh, we had a question from earlier, uh, about quarter after the hour. Um, of the, one of our viewers was wanting to know if you can use uh, trichoderma on wounds. Uh, I don't know. I have not really seen any compelling research. It's kind of like wound dressing. Um, we have, there's, it's a relatively new subject and haven't seen anything compelling that says, oh gosh, yes, we need to be using this. So again, uh, it's kind of like the, you know, the old Dalai Lama saying, if, if you can't help, then do no harm. So it's a matter of, if it's gonna help the tree, fine. But if, if you don't know the outcomes of your treatments, then you should definitely not be doing them. That's what we call ethical, uh, practice in our industry. Err on the side of caution. Exactly. All right. Um, so would you say, is it appropriate to prune in dormant seasons if the tree is susceptible to diseases? No. I, if, you have, if, if you have known presence of disease, like um, we have a lot of, in our area, we don't have so much oak wilt, but we do have a, a fire blight, which is really pervasive in our area. Um, if you have known infections or infestations in your area, uh, then and that you've been pruning other places, you want to make sure you disinfect your tools, of course. Um, but certainly don't prune if you know that there's uh, disease issues in your area. And it may be very site specific. Okay. Um, in the example you showed, uh, how do you justify cutting off 50% of a tree to a homeowner? I mean, that's not easy but obviously you know if you know that it has to happen how do you how do you justify that to someone who is ignorant of the subject well i you know i believe as professional arborists that we are it's incumbent upon us to educate the homeowner the tree owner and i you know what it comes down to is how long do you want this tree to stand do you want to see it for a long time to be in front of your house um, we need to make sure that they understand that if you don't do anything, it has a greater potential for failure than if we, than if we mitigate those issues. And again, in order to not take off 50% all at once and try to make it more aesthetically acceptive, receptive to the, the tree owner, is again, try to accomplish uh, working with them in sessional pruning. Just take a little bit off at, at a time you know, take 25% off in one, in one uh, session and then maybe take the rest off the next. Again, it depends on if the client's willing to do that or not. And I think that's a good responsible arborist is understand what the limitations of your client and your, and your tree are and try to balance those. How long so can you spread you, that out? Pardon me? How long can you spread that out? Like take the 25% and maybe do another 25 or something? If it's uh, vigorously growing, you can go in the spring and even maybe come back in the fall or the following spring. So you okay. can do it pretty quickly. Again, it just depends on what the client's willing to accept. Now, I've been in situations where I've remedied a co-dominant and, and the client will come out and say, oh my gosh, what did you just do to my tree? Mm -hmm. And again, if you proactive and explain to them what it's going to look like, what you're going to do, then that's going to help alleviate some of that shock factor when they see half a tree gone. But You've got to emphasize the fact you just saved that tree and that reduce that likelihood of that tree splitting and failing. It doesn't hurt to carry some pictures around. We, as arborists, we see tree failures all the time as a result of storm damage. Take a few pictures where you see those co-dominant splits. Say, hey, this is what could happen to your tree if we don't do something here. Picture speaks a thousand words. Right. And not that I'm hinting at this, quiz, 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 quiz. Are you able to go over again if you didn't mention it the uh the new ANSI 300 standard yeah the ANSI the new ANSI uh standards especially the new BMP really emphasizes a couple of things one is pruning objectives making sure that you have clear objectives when you go into pruning um, talks a lot about branch aspect ratio and understanding trying to have that two to one or 50 percent or 50 to one ratio um, as far as uh, primary or parent stem to secondary stem. Um, also, another thing that it's, it is um, uh, um, introducing is as far as debris, 
Um, we want to make sure that we are being environmentally conscious and being responsible with the debris we generate. As arborists, we generate a lot of woody debris, and the standards say that we should be reutilizing that to its best, highest purpose. So that kind of puts a little bit of uh, a greater responsibility on us on what to do with uh, all that uh, woody debris that we generate during our, our activities. If there was one thing that you, you know, you want folks, and, and I know that weather is different throughout the country, but if there's a couple of thoughts um, that you want our viewers to leave with regarding pruning right now, what would those be? Well, with a lot of the storms we've had recently, it's, 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 as I mentioned earlier, it's gonna challenge how we look at our trees. You can't storm proof a tree. Because when we look at trees and we try to identify what we need to do to improve sustainability and safety, um, really what we want to look at is what is that tree, how's that tree going to respond under normal conditions. Now we can't play what if once winds get above 60 miles per hour or, or according to uh, Dr. Gilman, once I think he said above 58 miles per hour, everything's off, doesn't matter what kind of tree structure you have. But, Again, as arborists, I think the important thing for us to do, if we're in the canopy doing crown cleaning, crown raising, whatever it is that we're doing, we need to be mindful of trying to remedy some of that poor tree structure. Look at those co-dominant stems, uh, poor branch attachments, uh, poor ratio, one-to-one -one ratio branches, and trying to, trying to be proactive in improving branch structure. I think that's the most important thing. Remember, co-dominant's a bad word. And when those tree limbs bifurcate, that means they have an opportunity for failure. And so if we can remedy that and reduce any number of those, then we're gonna make a difference in the longevity of that tree. What would you say about, um, you know, we've been talking about technology recently. Um, what would you say is some latest technology or some things on the horizon that you think will make uh, an impact in pruning for performance and prevention? Well, one of the things that's really helped, um, I, and I'm, they're really catching on and become more popular is the use of uh, unmanned aerial vehicles. Um, drones have given us the opportunity to give a better look at especially larger trees we can't see from ground-based uh, perspective uh, to see what some issues are up in the tree. Um, well, I think the, what's really important is the fact that we have, research takes a long time when we're looking at trees and a lot of these rock star researchers that we're starting to get information from is just now coming to light because it takes about 20 to 30 years to really get a good data set and extrapolate the information that helps us improve uh, tree health and growth. Well, we have uh, uh, Dylan is asking uh, or commenting at this point, in situations where a large uh, pruning cut is made, leaving a large wound that the tree is unlikely to compartmentalize, especially in species that are known poor compartmentalized as poor compartmentalizers. Uh, he has heard some arborists recommend leaving a stub cut, the idea being to keep the decay out of the main stem and in the stub. Is this what you're recommending or beneficial to the tree in any way? Now, if you leave, remember, if you're leaving a large if you're leaving a stub, you're basically leaving a small branch that has no life support and no leaves, nothing that can support it to keep it green. So as a result, that smaller branch that's the stub is gonna decay much faster and actually just acts as a conduit to go into the main trunk. So I, there is nothing, no research that supports a stub cut as being effectual as far as improving the tree's ability to recover from pruning wounds. The best recovery for pruning wounds is a good pruning cut outside the branch bark ridge, mindful of the branch protection zone, and of course making the smallest wound possible. Is it, is it naive of, of me to say, because I've kind of heard this as well, you know, don't go in without a plan before you start cutting. You know, it's like shoot, ready, aim. <laughs> Um, and, and it doesn't mean that uh, you, you don't have the knowledge, but obviously taking you know, one step at a time and erring on the side of caution, which you mentioned earlier, um, are you finding that, that that's probably the best approach is to make doubly sure 
before you do anything? Yeah, well, it certainly is, Jake. One of the things I talk, often give presentations on is the ethical arbor culture. And oftentimes our ego gets in the way of our, of our practice. And, you know, we have lot, our network is pretty close and we have lots of people, knowledgeable people that we can use as resources. And, you know, just on Facebook alone, that's one of those technological things that has improved our mm -hmm. practice. I mean, I'm a member of several groups and there's a lot of good information on there. And our, don't be afraid to ask. I mean, you know, if you don't know what you're doing, again, ethically, you should not be doing it. That's like going to the doctor and say, huh, let's try this out. Let's see if it makes you feel better. Well, if they don't know the outcomes, it's probably not going to be good. So again, a good arborist, a good ethical arborist will know the outcomes of your measures before you do them. Otherwise, you could be doing uh, more harm than good to the tree. It just, and it's, I know it's a common sense question, but you know, I know sometimes when I do work around the house or whatever, because I'm ignorant to, uh, I'm not a master arborist, <laughs> you know, you, you, sometimes you just have to, you know, kind of see it before you do it. Yeah. And I've been the other way where I do it and I'm like, oh, why did I? Yeah, I think the big thing is don't be afraid to ask. There's a lot of people out there that in, in our area, uh, in, in our industry, rely on industry uh, like the, your Indiana Arborist Association or your local chapter. The ISA has so much research material available. Uh, I would say uh, YouTube. Uh, YouTube has been a blessing and a curse. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of good YouTube videos on there. But again, I, like I tell my students, look at the source first. Um, production value really doesn't matter if the resource is not credible. Um, like you guys have some great webinars on here um, and I've seen some pretty crazy dangerous bad stuff on YouTube that people are taking as a good practice and it's really not and it's dangerous. Right. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say because there's a lot of opinions floating around about this and that and all that, but you have to take each one with a grain of salt. Exactly, you know, check your sources. That's what I tell my students all the time is whether you're doing research online for white papers or you're doing research on YouTube, check your sources and make sure that they're current and they're also credible. Okay, once again, how can people get a hold of you? Um, actually, uh, just look for me on the web, just Google my name, Lindsay Purcell, at Purdue, and uh, all my contact information will show up. And again, through the Indiana Arborist Association as well. Uh, thank you for all the work you're doing and thank you for the education tonight. We got a lot of great positive feedback Good. Uh, from this webinar. And obviously we have a quiz coming up as well. Did, was there anything you needed to touch on that we didn't talk about that's in the quiz? No, I actually, the quiz is pretty close to what I talked about. So if you were here and paying attention, you should have no trouble with that quiz. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll see how you do, Jake. Thanks, Lindsay. <laughs> I did have the answers, so, I, you know. <laughs> hey, we have, um, we have to remind you that if you score 16 or above on the quiz, you will be uh, awarded those CEUs, but give them a little bit of time, uh, about six to eight weeks for it to all be processed. We're gonna have that quiz up at that link until July 8th, so you have until then to take that quiz and then it's going to be shut down because we're going to get in jambo mode as if we're not already. I know Carson is pretty much in jambo mode right now. Hey, we got to mention two weeks from tomorrow, jambo six here in beautiful Indianapolis. Can't believe it's six. I'm yeah. Like, what an event. It's grown to be quite an event. Yep. Yep. And this year we've got a lot of great things happening, some new things as well. and. You wouldn't believe some of the climbers that are going to be involved in this. It's going to be unbelievable. World-class climbers. Not just one, but several. Tree athletes. Tree athletes. Very The very, best. Yeah. <laughs> hopefully I'll do a tree interview and with, with some of them, hopefully. But anyway, we're going to have a three-day competition from the 12th to the 15th, and then you know, of course, it's going to be fun for the entire family. And on the 15th, we're going to be hosting a free training day that features four individual presentations on rigging, DRT to SRT, safety, and climbing systems featuring the Akimbo. And guess what? ISA and CTSB CEUs will be available to anyone who attends that training session on Monday. So you can go on our Facebook page go on to events 
and you can RSVP that training day. Lots of great information from experts in our field, uh, and you can earn some CEUs to boot. If you want to volunteer at Jambo, you can earn CEUs doing that too from uh, the, uh, the ISA and the um, CTSP CEUs. We got a boatload for you. So go to our Facebook page and look for the information to volunteer. It's there. We need your help to make Jambo 6 another successful event. And thank you again for making tonight a very successful webinar. We couldn't do this without you, and obviously we couldn't do it without experts like Lindsay here. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, we hope you are going to leave with lots of information and education. So keep it tuned in. Obviously, we're going to take a little bit of a break because of Jambo, but we will be back at the end of July with Albert Cooper, who's our resident uh, uh, plant health care expert. He's going to talk with Great us webinars. a little bit about uh, that. So you'll probably check that one out, won't you? Yeah, I've watched his web webinars before. They're great. He's a walking thesaurus. He really is. Anyway, thanks again to Carson, who's behind the booth, and Nick and Kale and everybody who helped put this webinar on. All our, all our buddies out there, thanks a lot. And we will see you in two weeks at Jambo. Good night, everybody. We'll see you soon.